Well, happy Easter via church. I hope that you're ready to worship this morning. Uh, Luke chapter 24, as we go to worship, this is the moment. Uh, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Let's pray this morning and prepare our hearts to worship. God, we come today thankful people, grateful people uh, to know you, this, this living, reigning, ruling king today. God, we come to worship uh, not, a, not a, a God that we just think about or believe in, but Lord, a God that's alive and that's among us in every place that we are right now, that you're here, that you're with us. And so as we sing these songs, as we bring our prayers to you, as we bring our attention to you, as we hear the truth of your word today, we invite you to have your way in our homes, in our families, in our lives, uh, that this risen and reigning king um, would interact with us today. We invite you now as we worship you together in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship this morning. Sing, he's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. And we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. There is good news for the captive. Shamed. There is good news for the one who walked away. And there is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. And he's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. And we are free from sin for For the one the world ignores, he is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. For the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. He's our rescuer.
alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Dash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your chains I'm a Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. sing those words together, um, and I can hear you in my ears this morning. It's beautiful. Um, as, we, as we worship together, as, as we're going to this next song, I want to just kind of give you an image. Um, this next song is kind of a favorite around here of, of, of singing about Jesus, and it's called Is He Worthy? 
And there's some imagery in the song that's, that's, that's biblical, and, and if you're not familiar with it, it might be kind of weird, but there's, this, there's this, this image that John sees. There's this revelation that John has in the book of Revelation, and, and there's this scroll that has a seal on it. And they're looking for someone who can, who can open the scroll, and the scroll kind of represents what's, what's going to happen in the world. And I know for us right now in the world, we have some uncertainty about what, what happens next. There's a lot of uncertainty over these last few weeks and looking into the future. Um, but then they're, as they're looking for someone to open the scroll, they can't find anyone. There's weeping and there's, there's sadness and sorrow. But then Jesus is the one who's worthy. He's the one who can open the scroll, this lamb that was slain. Um, and so this morning as we, as we sing this, we're singing about a God who's, who's alive, a God who holds the future in his hands. And the Savior that has saved us, the Savior that is with us, the Savior that we sing to this morning, um, we're secure in him as he holds our future. And so let's sing this, let's sing this to Jesus this morning.
in John 17. Before Jesus goes to the cross, he prays this prayer, and it's called the the high priestly prayer. And in the midst of that prayer, he says in verse 20 and 21, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So here Jesus is praying for his disciples and then praying for those who will come, who will follow him. So I'd like to to pray today. Let's pray. So God, may we all be one so that the world would believe. As we gather together on this Easter Sunday with, with Christ followers and churches all across this globe, all in unity, worshiping our Savior, celebrating what you have done for us. And I think of the moment of this time with the craziness and the way that we have to do it differently than we've ever done Easter Sunday before, at least in many of our lifetimes. And yet there are people in places all over this globe making it work, making it happen, striving and and working to worship you in ways that I pray that the world will see, that the world will see what is going on with these people, that they would go so out of their way to celebrate this moment in history. And we would say it's because of Jesus. It is because he is alive. It is because he is working. It is because in the midst of uncertainty, we have confidence in our Savior. And so God, do your great work in your church I pray for every Christ follower on the, on the face of this earth right now that as we celebrate this Easter Sunday that we would be strengthened and encouraged and that people would see you through us, that they would see our unity in you and that they would believe. And so God, we pray this in the mighty and the triumphant name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well. Before you go anywhere right now, I'm going to ask you that you would go to viachurch.org slash lobby. And on there, it's going to take you to a link to go to our church lobby in our Facebook group. And so if you would do that right now, interact with each other, welcome each other to church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. If you would sign in with us right now, if you would go to viachurch.org slash sign in and you would put your first and last name and if you, if you want to put your wife or your husband on there as well, you can do that. Um, if you have kids, I would encourage you, let your kids sign in themselves. They would love to do that. And teenagers, the same thing if you would do that as well. And then if you are new with us, We would love for you to put all of your information in there. And and what that'll help us to do is help us to send you some information about who we are and what next steps are. And speaking of next steps, coming up on um, April 26th, we have Start Here. And this is your next step here at Via Church. And so it helps you to get to know us better. You get to spend some time with some of our leadership. And you get to hear about just who we are and what we're about. And so you can register for that at viachurch.org slash start here. And if you are in process already and you are in one of the This Is Via sessions for your next step, 
you will be receiving an email giving you a link to register as well for that. And so we know that there's a lot going on during this time. And so, and with that, it can make for tough times for many people. And so on Tuesday evenings, we want to bring to your attention that we have Celebrate Recovery continuing through this time. It meets at 6.30. You can go to viachurch.org slash online to be able to join that on Tuesday nights. And this is for anyone. This is for if you need a place to talk, if you need someone that you need accountability with, if you want a group of people that you can, during, during this moment of time in your life, be able to lean on, all of that stuff, that anybody with hurts, habits, and hang-ups that are becoming great during this moment, please join us at 6.30 on Tuesday nights for Celebrate Recovery. And via youth, via kids, they're continuing to do stuff as well. And so there's many ministry connections and all kinds of opportunities. And so via kids had an Easter jam yesterday. It was yesterday morning. And um, they're doing online devotionals throughout the week. And then they're meeting with their small groups on Thursday late afternoons. And so all of those things are happening at viachurch.org slash online. Um, Via Youth had a Netflix party last night, and they do Wednesday nights and still junior high and Sunday afternoons in the middle of the afternoon. And so all of those links are in the exact same place, viachurch.org slash online. Right now we're going to prepare our hearts to give. And so we got a couple different options of the way that you can give. You can give online at viachurch.org slash give. You can also take your check and you can mail it if you would rather do that. You can send it to Via Church at 740 North Power Road, Mesa, Arizona, 85205. Or you can drop your offering off by the church. Um, Our office hours are on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 9 to 3 p.m., both of those days during the week. And so thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for handling what God has given you and being great stewards of it. Let's pray over this offering right now. So God, we thank you for the way that you've taken care of us, for the the things that you've put into our hands. And so right now, as we give back to you, um, we say thank you. We do it with a, a heart of gratitude, knowing that you are our sustainer, that you are the one that provides for us. And so we look to you in these moments, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you give, if you would also open your Bibles, we are in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20 verses 1 through 22. You can also pull this up on your mobile device at viachurch.org slash live. And so if you would read with me, I will begin reading in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. 
Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. So God, as we read your word and as we spend these next few moments in in your word, we pray that it would change us and transform us, that we would see you more clearly and that it would change the way that we live and we act. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I am so glad that you have joined us. Happy Easter, everyone. And uh, this Easter is different in so many ways. But one thing remains unchanged. Our hope in Jesus remains. Uh, There's a lot of things that we cannot do right now, but we can today freely worship our risen Savior. And I'm excited today to, to gather together with you, and I know that the Holy Spirit is working among us as we worship together and join with the collective worldwide church in celebrating our risen Savior. When we think about Jesus' death and resurrection, it can sometimes feel like it's an abstract spiritual reality that is not relevant to our human experience. Uh, We might ask questions something like this, uh, how can one man's death bring me life? Or even if the resurrection actually happened, what difference does it make in my life and in this world? Or maybe you're thinking in, in light of a worldwide pandemic, why are Christians around this globe going to such great lengths to celebrate an event that took place over 2,000 years ago. As postmodern Westerners, we are practical, we are pragmatic, and we tend to weigh these ancient Christian truths by our own assessment of how much it might help us get along in life. Our tendency is to feel if the, if the resurrection seems helpful to me, I may believe it. If it doesn't seem helpful, I, I won't. If something is helpful, I'll adapt my life to it and call it truth. If the resurrection of Jesus isn't helpful, then I will sort of view it maybe like I view a UFO theory. But realities and information come at us every day and we have to sift through that. And we need to be aware of our own assumptions and how we tend to process information. And as we lay the resurrection of Jesus before us today in Scripture, my prayer is that we would see it as something that really does matter to each of us and really does matter in this world in which we live. I want to sort of begin with a sermon that the Apostle Paul preached to philosophy lovers on Mars Hill in Athens about 20 years after the death of Jesus. I actually have stood on Mars Hill right at the foot of the Acropolis and and, uh, read these words right there so I can picture where this happened. But he preached to these philosophers. He said this in Acts 17, verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Verse 32, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Sometimes we can think about Christianity in the ancient world and we can think that, well, maybe Christianity spread in a gullible world that thought resurrections were normal. But this shows us that these were uh, intelligent people. These were people that were thinking and these were people that were not gullible. So we have to question, how then was this truth accepted? That's a great question, and Scripture gives us a record of of how that happened. 
One of the main things I want you to understand today as you're watching this is that the resurrection will matter to you. Paul in this sermon says that God calls all people everywhere to repent because we've all sinned against him. And this repentance is urgent because God in his perfect righteousness is going to judge the whole world. And he's going to judge it by a man, his son, Jesus Christ. Someday, my friend, Jesus will be the judge of every human someday. Every person will stand before the living God-man, Jesus. And our excuses will not work in that court because we are guilty, all of us, unless we are found in Christ, having trusted Jesus as our Savior. Acts 17, 31 says, He has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection is God's assurance. It's his, it's, it's his evidence, his proof that repentance is necessary. And whether you find it helpful or not to you today, God's judgment is coming. And this judgment isn't like the possibility of a life in another galaxy. Rather, it is like death. It is coming. It does concern you because you can participate in his resurrection and it will matter to you because the resurrected Jesus will be your judge. When we believe, when we trust, when we follow, when we receive, we can experience the realities of a risen Christ. One of the things we find in our text is that God always designed for us to know Christ through witnesses. In our text that Donovan read, Mary encounters Jesus in the tomb and goes to tell the disciples. She says, I have seen the Lord. God always intended for the resurrection to be known and to be believed through human witness. And here, 20 centuries later, still approximately 32% of the world claims Christianity. The Spirit opens our eyes, but the witness of Christ always comes through someone. Maybe someone invited you to watch this service this morning. It's because Jesus changed their life. They're not wanting you just to sign on to some truth that they mentally ascend to, but Christ has changed them. And what they have found to be true is that the resurrected Savior is alive today and can be experienced, and they want you to know him. They, have, they are bearing witness to you that Christ is risen. When we think of the resurrection that, that time 2,000 years ago, there's no video footage, there's no photographs of that, of that resurrection. When it happened, though, God saw to it that there were witnesses. Jesus appeared to witnesses, actually hundreds, in enough settings that they were fully convinced of the reality of the resurrection, so convinced that they could tell others and write it down for us. Even today, God still uses human witnesses in order for the resurrection to be known and believed. And just you watching this today, this is a human witness of the resurrection. I remember when I was uh, in middle school and I was invited to a high school youth group. I was so excited because I was one of the younger ones there, but I got to hang out with high schoolers. And I remember the very first night as they sang and they worshiped and they taught the Bible and I did not know Christ the way I do today. And, and the leader, Steve, was talking about being born again. I had never heard these kinds of words. And afterwards, I went and sat on the sofa of his living room and said, what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be saved? And he took out the scriptures and went to John 3. And he talked about this conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. And he said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that moment, sitting on this plaid couch in this living room in the upper Midwest, 
in middle school, I remember Steve leading me through a prayer. And I remember that night putting my trust in Jesus. And that night, my friend, I experienced the resurrected Christ that I testify to you today about. Today, I'm not trying to win you over to some thought or creed or way of life. But today, I bear witness that Jesus is alive and Jesus can be experienced and you can experience him as well. And you can do this through the Spirit. John's resurrection account is is unique compared to the other Gospels. John leads the reader from from the empty tomb to the real meaning of the resurrection. And that is the creation of a new relationship between Jesus and his disciples and those who believed in him. Their relationship will now be through the Holy Spirit. John shows the longing that Mary had to be with the Lord in our text. Mary turns to Jesus and clings to him. Her beloved teacher has come back from the dead and her grief is banished. This fulfills what Jesus said in John 14, 18. He told his followers, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Today, Jesus tells his believers around this world today, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In our text, Jesus will now make these followers sons and daughters of God by giving them the Spirit. His followers in our text will now live in a relationship of love and obedience to Jesus, which nothing can destroy. You look at verse 17, something changes there. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father. Notice the possessiveness of there, your Father. To my God, he says, and to your God. And he promised to even two or three gathered in his name that he's in their midst. Look at verse 20. On that evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Can you imagine this scene? The disciples with the doors locked with, for fear of the Jews, worried that they might be arrested or also put to death. And Jesus appears right in their midst. A couple of weeks ago, as I came back from meetings, I had been notified that I was exposed to COVID-19 and I was to self-quarantine. And Susan and I sort of separated in the house and I went to a guest room and moved some things in there. And in order to come out of that room, I would wash up and put on a mask, but I didn't even stay in other parts of the house. I would either be in my room or outside. And for 12 days, I sort of felt this quarantine, just being alone. I I even preached the Sunday sermon uh, from my own iPad and a music stand in my my bedroom. But when I was thinking about those moments, I remember a couple of moments just feeling cooped up, feeling frustrated. And and I remember just praying and I, I heard this song that we've been doing the last couple of weeks, the throne room song, and, and just saying that this is holy ground. You are here right now. And as I would sing that and worship Jesus in that room, suddenly something would change in my heart and the anxiety and the fear and will I come down with this disease and what's happening in the world and how is the church going to function and is Susan okay? All of these things that were just bringing anxiety in me suddenly as I would worship Jesus, the spirit of Jesus would come into that room and bring peace because I could sense his presence. And here Jesus shows up in the middle of this, this, this house and, and the door is locked and the first thing that he says is peace be with you. His gift to them is shalom, peace 
And as soon as he gives peace to his followers, he then sends them as peace bearers into the public life of the world. Today, my prayer is that as Christ followers, as we experience the fear and the anxiety of the things that are going on, that we would be people of the presence of God and the shalom of God and the peace of God, that we would not just be proclaimers of truth, but that we would be bearers of peace in public life right now. He said, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, so I send you. They are now going to participate in his mission. They will carry the death and life of Jesus in their everyday life. And he breathed on them. I I know that's ironic to say right now because we don't want anyone breathing on us, but Jesus, breathe on me. Breathe on us and give us your spirit. And when he breathed on them in verse 22, new life entered them like life entered into Adam when he was formed from the dust of the earth. In Genesis 2, 7, that God breathed into man and the man became a living creature in the same way here as Jesus in his resurrected body breathes on his disciples, he breathes life into them. The resurrection matters because you too today can have new life from the Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the same Spirit that he breathes upon those that would trust in him and believe in him. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He didn't just raise from the dead. He is the resurrection. In Jesus' resurrection, we see a foretaste of God's final glorious restoration of all things, including our bodies. The resurrection of Jesus is a preview of our resurrection. Scripture makes it clear because Christ has been raised from the dead, we too shall rise. Jesus is coming back to this earth in power and in great glory. And this event and this story that we read today is a window into that glory. As you experience suffering and death in this life, know that he loves you and he will show you his glory even in your suffering. Many thought that it was all over when Jesus died. But nothing is over until Jesus says it's over. My friend, nothing is over until Jesus says it's over. Death did not have the final say. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that dead things can still come to life? Even now, in the place where you live, can dead things come to life? Because nothing is over, my friend, till Jesus says it is over. Regardless of what you see, regardless of what you feel, and regardless of what everyone is telling you and what all of the models and the forecasts are saying. You might say, well, I'm in a, I'm in a loveless marriage. I've tried everything. It's over. No, my friend, I've seen God break through. I've seen hearts humbled. I've seen things turn completely around. I've seen communication come, and and it wasn't over because Jesus said it wasn't over. And there are followers of Christ today that would say, Jesus healed my marriage. You might say, look, I've lost my job. I'm losing everything. It's over. I've been furloughed. I've been cut back. But I've seen... What can happen when people in desperate straits make Christ the head of their finances? I've seen it come down to the last minute, but it wasn't over because Jesus said it wasn't over and he supplied needs right when they were needed. 
You might be watching all of the things happening right now and you might say, I'm fearful. The future is so uncertain. But today, Jesus holds you today and he holds your future. He can be trusted. He brings new life to dreams that seem dead. So in your hands today, you may hold the lifeless remains of whatever situation in your life that you've concluded is over. Something in your family, something in your job, something in your health, something that maybe keeps hounding you from your past, you know what it is. And you may have convinced yourself that it's never going to get any better, but not everything that dies ends in death. It's not over until Jesus says it's over. And he loves resurrecting things that can bring him glory to his name. The gospel is called the good news. There's a whole redemptive story from creation to new creation. But the good news is, my friend, that the kingdom that Jesus is going to establish is here now in Jesus. Oh, it's not fully yet realized, but it can be experienced. Between the death of Jesus and his resurrection three days later, many could not see how God could be glorified in it. That wouldn't be revealed until his resurrection. And many of us today stand in that same place, especially with a, a world pandemic you may be experiencing loneliness or separation from loved ones or someone in the hospital that you normally would be right at their side, but you can only wait in a parking lot or wait for a phone call. You might have experienced a death. Maybe you're facing your own mortality and you've just been fearful about getting COVID-19. And some of us today, we stand in the same place. We, we see death, but we haven't yet fully experienced the resurrection of Christ in our lives. And we should not judge before the resurrection. God is doing more than you know, and the resurrection will bring it all to light. In the meantime, while we wait for God to restore all things and bring his kingdom fully to this earth, we are called simply to trust Jesus and treasure him above all things. Today, as Christians, we do not waive the truth of the resurrection as if it suddenly renders death in all its forms painless and meaningless. We hold on in hope for the time that has been promised, the time that is yet to come. Today, as I check the news a number of times, one of the greatest questions everyone's asking is, when will COVID-19 be over? When will life go back to normal? When will we be able to go back to the way things are supposed to be? And for most of us, that's just going back a couple of weeks or a couple of months where some of us would just go, well, well, I'd go back to January of 2020. Things were better. That's the way things are supposed to be. But we even lose sight of all the brokenness that was in January. And when I think about the larger picture, all of creation is groaning and waiting for everything that is, is broken in this world to go back to the way it was at the very beginning. All of creation today groans for its redemption because all of creation is longing and waiting and pining for the day that this world functions as God created it to function. We hope for January 2020, but all of creation hopes for the way things were at the very beginning back in Genesis, and it's going to be new. It is a new creation. The world longs and waits. We hold on to this hope for this time that is yet promised in which there will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain, and things will be made new. But we're not there yet. 
And today, that future new creation, that future restoration can break into today and break into your life and bring new life and bring healing and wholeness to your life. And he today desires to raise the things that have been dead and broken in your life. And he longs to restore them for his namesake. And then all of us, as we look to the future, we know what Revelation 21, 4 says, there will be a day, my friend, that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The good news, my friend, of the resurrection is there can be resurrection, new life that you experience today by knowing Christ and experiencing Christ and him breathing his spirit into you. And you can have hope that someday all things will be made new again in Jesus. Can we pray together? If you're watching and you sense the Spirit of God doing something in your life, I encourage you to put your trust in Christ today. To believe in Christ and find life in His name. Today, I invite you to experience newness in Christ, to become a new creation in Christ. I invite you to allow the old to pass away and to find new life in Christ. So, Father, we hold our lives, we hold the brokenness of our lives before you. And we thank you that nothing is too difficult for you, that you are able to save. We surrender our lives to you once again today. We ask, Lord, that you would breathe upon us your spirit and bring life to the dead things and the dead situations of our lives for your namesake. We declare our trust in you today for you can be trusted. You are our ever-present help in times of trouble and we turn to you and we pray that you would break into our lives newness, restoration, healing, that we might put you on display. And like others have given witness to us, that we would witness that hope to others. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We practice the Lord's table each time we gather each week. And we've encouraged you to, to have maybe bread and something to drink together. We know that this is not ideal. We know that these are not the best of circumstances. But we do know that the church is gathered. And the church is gathered today. And today we join the worldwide church and these sacraments, these ordinances of the church. I invite you to take anything that you might have there that you can use as elements and remember the Lord's body that was given for us and his blood that was shed for us. Paul talks about the Lord's table. He gave instructions to the early church in 1 Corinthians 11. He talks about how we need to examine ourselves before we eat and drink. So let's just take a moment, could we? And examine our hearts before we receive these elements. Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Let's pray together. We celebrate, Lord Jesus, your resurrection. But we remember how your body was given for us. We remember the stripes on your back. We remember the crown of thorns upon your head. We remember the nails in your hands and in your feet. And it should have been us. For you didn't deserve it, and we did. But we thank you that you did this in our place, that we might have life and have life eternal. Let's partake together. Paul continues in verse 25. He says, in the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So Lord Jesus, we join with your worldwide church taking of this bread and of this cup and proclaiming your death until you come again, until that new creation is realized. We thank you that you cleanse us from our sins, that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our sins from us. Though our sins were as scarlet, you've made them as white as snow. The righteousness of Jesus applied to us through faith. Jesus, be our strength, be our sustenance. Nourish us today as we take these elements. Let's partake of the cup together. I'll just thank Jesus for a moment, would you? I know you're there, you're in front of a TV screen or your phone or a computer or an iPad or a tablet. Just give him thanks right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you're alive today, that we're not talking to someone who's far off or distant, but we are talking to a Savior today who knows suffering and pain and entered our world of suffering and pain and is today risen at the right hand of God the Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Ah, oh, church, let's worship Jesus for a moment before we close. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. So from heaven, you came running. There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit in the flame now this gospel text today, Jesus says to his disciples, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. May the peace of God go with you on this Easter Sunday. You have been sent into this world by Jesus. You have been empowered by his Holy Spirit to be witnesses. And so as you go in peace, also remember, you go in power, in his resurrection power. And so as you go, I pray this in the name of the Father, through the work of the Son, Jesus Christ. And today, we go by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy Easter. Go as God goes with you.